and um, to uh, um, to the Sheehan Gallery for inviting me to moderate this panel. I'm really excited to have some really wonderful panelists with us who are all three uh, museum professionals or museum adjacent professionals. Um, and uh, to kind of hear what their experience as museum professionals has been like. So I'm just going to uh, give you a brief introduction to our three panelists, and then we'll go ahead and ask them some questions. There will be some time at the end for um, questions from uh, attendees, and uh, I'll ask you to put those questions in the chat box. So um, the way... Oh yeah, I also want to say a thing about something about timing because I think the way that we advertise this, we said we were going to go till about 510, but our panelists have very generously agreed to be with us a little longer just so we make sure we have time for questions from you all. Um, so we're going to go till about 525. Um, if anybody needs to leave, obviously you can do that, but um, I hope this will leave us plenty of time to hear more from them um, about their, their experience. Our first panelist is uh, Dr. Laura Ferguson, who is the Senior Curator of Western History at the High Desert Museum in Bend, Oregon, where she develops exhibitions on interdisciplinary topics, supports the museum's historical interpretation, and collaborates with community partners. Laura holds a PhD in history from the University of Michigan and previously served as a visiting assistant professor at Whitman College in Walla Walla, Washington, where um, we knew her back in the day, so it's really exciting to have Laura back here. Really happy to hear from her. Um, our second panelist is Randall Melton, uh, who is the exhibits coordinator for the Tomas Licht Cultural Institute, which is owned and operated by the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. Uh, Randall grew up on the Umatilla Indian Reservation and is an enrolled member of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma. Randall attended Whitman College, so also a return returner, returnee, <laughs> um, and graduated from Eastern Oregon University with a BS in anthropology and sociology. During his time at Whitman, Randall worked at, as an intern at the Max Museum. He also interned at the Smithsonian National Museum in, of the American Indian, the Whitman Mission, and has worked for Tomas Licht since 1996. And uh, last but not least, our third panelist is Matt Lopez. Uh, Matt was, uh, he Matt currently works at the Walla Walla Foundry, and he was born and raised in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where he was educated in a back to the land Waldorf tradition. I'd love to hear more about that. That sounds really interesting. Um, from art galleries to museums, Matt has worked at many institutions, including Radio 3 Gallery, Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, Mills College Art Museum, and for the past 10 years at the San Francisco um, Museum of Modern Art, SFMOMA. During his career, Matt has worked with many artists from art students and emerging artists to more established artists, such as Matthew Bar Barney, uh, Via Selmans, Mark Bradford, and Barry McGee. He's also worked in art preservation, permanent collection shows, and mid to late career retrospective exhibitions, including Andy Warhol from A to B and Back Again, presented at the Whitney Museum of American Art in uh, New York and at SFMOMA in 2019. And he currently works as a production assistant technician at the Walla Walla Foundry. Okay, so that's a whole lot of expertise in the room, and um, I'm really excited to uh, turn this over to you. So maybe we could start with, um, in the order that I introduced you, um, start with Laura. Um, and my first question is, what made you want to do museum work, and what has kept you in the field? I'm really glad you asked that. Um, and for me, it's really a love of history and of public history. And... Um, I really feel like by thinking more about the past and understanding kind of how we got to our current moment, my hope is that we can imagine different futures. And I feel like in sharing, I, I really appreciate that in my job, I have the chance to share with people histories that they maybe weren't previously familiar with. And my hope is that it starts to get people thinking about things differently. So it's really that sense of being able to continue to connect with the public and the feeling that so many of the different subjects that we engage in in liberal arts education, um, that by kind of bringing those to the public, it really can help us think think differently about the moment we're in and how society might, might look different. Um, and for me, that's been especially you know, valuable as we're thinking more about anti-racism work. And I think too, in our kind of current moment of so much political polarization that these spaces where people can 
come together and um, engage in ideas that they might not have already been familiar with are really important. Thank you, Laura. Um, can I turn that same question over to Randall? So what uh, brought you to the field and what has kept you in it? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so uh, when I first came into the field, I actually was a econ major <laughs> at, uh, funny you say that, you had intern, uh, econ interns, but I was also an econ major when I uh, uh, first discovered that museums might be something I want to do. Um, and um, really growing up, my mom, she's a, libra she's a librarian, and uh, anytime we would go uh, out of town, we'd make a stop at, you know, whatever museum, library, uh, you know, uh, National Historic Site that was around. And so uh, just never really thought about it as a career, but uh, it really shaped who I am and um, my, my brothers and sisters, uh, how, we, how we think about things and, and, and the idea, um, echoing what Laura says, just uh, hearing multiple points of view and, and um, different perspectives and um, and for me, what keeps me going is trying to create those opportunities uh, to, to bring communities together, to bring different groups of people together, um, and to uh, help find ways to uh, find common ground and, um, you know, make, make, make history, culture, um, language, make that relevant um, to um, the, every, the, the um, everyday visitor. Um, and uh, just to, to let people know specifically with this museum, um, the history, the culture uh, of the Kayushi Matil and Walla Walla people, um, which is where I grew up uh, and had a lot of elders that um, talked to a lot of us um, at the time, younger people, um, and uh, were explaining the importance of what they were saying wasn't just to say it. Uh, they weren't just talking to hear themselves talk. They were telling us um, stories, histories, um, so that we could take those and, and tell the next uh, group of people that were coming behind us. And so to keep that going is, is extremely important. Um, and, and as we're finding out, it's becoming um, even more relevant um, to the, uh, not just the tribal community, but to everybody. Thanks, Randall. Um, Matt, can I ask you that same question? What brought you to the field and what keeps you in it? Or doesn't keep you in it as the case may be. You're actually not quite in it anymore. <laughs> yeah, so um, just uh, to be honest and forthright, so I worked in um, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art for the past 10 years, but currently work at the Walla Walla Foundry. So not in the field anymore, but um, I came to the field partially because I was an art student and needed a job and being around art seemed like a good one. Um, but uh, my relationship with the museum I worked at SF MoMA began when I was a high school student and, you know, was more of a graffiti um, street kid, not really interested in fine art until I started going to the museum and it really changed how I viewed uh, art specifically and cultural culture broadly. So I always believed in art museums as a cultural force. And uh, like Randall was saying, a point of connection, um, but also just on an individual experiential um, basis, just having a real connecting connection with art and that believing in that as a valuable thing for people. So I worked as a preparator, which is the behind the scenes art handlers and uh, fabricators that, that make the show happen. And um, the, that can, you know, you learn the behind the scenes and it can take away some of the gloss of a show in the museum world in general, but I really always believed in art exhibit, exhibits um, for cultures and communities. And so I always felt good about being part of that production, even though it was behind the scenes and uh, it was very satisfying. Well, I think that that's, you know, one of the things that a lot of folks who haven't worked in museums don't 
know much about and um, haven't, you know, they haven't seen that process. Uh, which uh, brings me to my next question for all three of you. Um, and maybe actually, Matt, you could start since you were, you know, talking about that behind the scenes work. What does a typical day in your professional life look like? And you can choose to address this talking about the foundry now or talking about um, SFMOMA as you prefer. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, I'm still getting to know the foundry and uh, being trained in various roles and it's a lot to take in. So I'll just, you know, go back to my previous role. Um, so, uh, and our preparator does a lot and, and the uh, uh, variety is a very interesting, but a typical day can look very different, but um, usually begins with gallery maintenance. Um, before the public arrives, there's about an hour to make everything look good. Um, that can just seem like, you know, fine art janitorial, but I always believed in it because people um, are, are going there for a special occasion and I really feel like it should show its best and be a good experience for them. Um, but also before the public arrives, there was a lot of movement uh, happening. So um, if we're going to be moving large art into into areas, galleries, um, that was not going to be able to be done with the public around. We try to do it in that early time um, or um, gathering tools and equipment, just getting set up to work and and. Um, you know, yeah, get a show going before the public arrived. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Laura, would you like to tell us a bit about your um, typical day in museum work? Yes, well, I will echo what Matt said, which is that it is definitely a varied day. And before coming to the museum, I did not know about art preparators or exhibition preparators, and they are vital and it's a really interesting job. So I think one of the things that um, has just been fun about being at the museum is learning about all the different roles that go into to, um, the museum and creating an exhibition. In terms of curatorial work, you know, on any given day, I might be anywhere in the exhibition development or installation process, which includes researching and writing the text, selecting the images, reaching out to other museums to borrow objects, um, talking with the collections manager about collections care, uh, working on, you know, being in the gallery painting and just helping get a show up. You know, it does last couple of weeks before a show goes up are always kind of all hands on deck situations. Um, I have a lot of different meetings and those meetings are with kind of internal HDM, other High Desert Museum team members to kind of think about the projects we're working on. And I'm also often working with community partners and um, I think I too really appreciate the variety, uh, you know, like so many jobs, sometimes I'm juggling a lot of projects and so it can feel like I'm kind of racing around from project to project, but it's a really nice mix of different things and some independent research time and then also, you know, one of my favorite things is working with our exhibits team to imagine what a show might look like and so it's a really fun um, brainstorming process as well. Thanks, Laura. Um, that resonates with my experience at the Max Museum. I think the first time that I ever met Randall was um, installing a show together at the Max Museum that we had we, that we had on loan from Thomas Lake. So, um, yeah, it's fun that you get to do all kinds of different things, including sometimes painting um, galleries. It's a nice break from intellectual work sometimes. Um, Randall, would you like to tell us about your um, typical day, <laughs> or no such, no such thing, maybe? No such thing. No, I, I love um, the fact um, that it really is a varied job. And um, because our staff, we have a smaller staff, um, you end up doing a little bit of everything depending on the day. That's why they put the other duties as assigned on your job description, because that, I mean, it is, it is the truth. Um, there, there'll be days where I actually end up uh, covering the front desk or uh, uh, in the store selling, um, uh, you know, gift shop items. Uh, but no, the, the main uh, part of it 
uh, in recent years for me has been the uh, traveling exhibits and our permanent exhibits. So one of the one of my favorite things that I get to do uh, up until this last year um, is to look for traveling exhibits uh, that um, we can bring to the museum and put into our uh, temporary gallery uh, or uh, our exhibit hallway. Um, and so my goal with that is just to try to find, um, uh, you know, unique voices or, or um, unique things that you might not see in um, Eastern Oregon. Uh, you might have to go to Portland or uh, Seattle or something like that to, to see Adams. Um, we did a Andy Warhol show a few years back. So that was um, something that was uh, 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 great to do. And so you get to um, sometimes handle and uh, be a part of um, or be around objects that are that have, you know, these great stories uh, and these great lives that go with them. And, uh, you know, you, um, one of the one of the moments that I remember um, most is we brought the Treaty of 1855, which is the treaty that these three tribes here signed. Um, we were able to bring pieces of that back to the reservation to be on display for the hundred and or the um, 150th anniversary of its signing. And uh, I was one of three people that got to be there when it came out of the crate and you put it on display and then it goes behind glass. And, and uh, so it was, it was quite a moment. So you kind of live for moments like that. Um, and you, um, as Laura said, you know, you're doing a lot of that um, uh, meeting with uh, community partners and, and meeting with your um, community and your staff to try to make exhibits and public programs and um, and all those the best that they can be uh, and, and, um, and trying to, trying to you know, get, get, get people into the building and get to see these, these great things that we have. So I kind of, I don't know, that was all over the place, but so is my pretty much every day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think what we've learned from that question is that there is um, no such thing as a typical day. And then maybe also that, you know, smaller or museums with a smaller staff uh, the jobs sometimes end up being less specialized and more varied, even if you're kind of hired for one specific thing. Um, I think, uh, Matt, it sounds like you had a more clearly defined role at SFMOMA, um, whereas Lauren, Randall, you're both talking about kind of, you know, all hands on deck doing all kinds of different things. Um, so that's maybe something for uh, students interested in museum careers to, to be aware of, as well as how those roles are different. Um, Matt. Yeah, if you don't mind, I just wanted to follow something Randall said, and that's just the uh, relationship to specific objects. And I would just say that one of the big benefits of museum work, especially being an art handler, is you, you get to handle these pieces which have such a history or are brand new. And um, you know, SF MoMA has a permanent collection. That's a very interesting thing because you really get to know these objects that tell a specific story. And uh, really, I mean, there, a lot of artworks became like friends where they would go into storage and come back out. I'm like happy to see it again. Um, but then also traveling exhibits and getting to see works that have been in the world a long time and might have had had different meanings at different times to different people. And to be a part of that, bringing that uh, to a new public, a new community is really interesting and exciting. Great, thank you for following up on that, um, Matt. I think that is, that's a really important piece of of museum work, right, is that relationship to specific objects. Um, this is a question that's probably uh, particularly interesting to um, our students who might be interested in museum work in the future. If you were a recent college graduate and um, you wanted to enter the museum field, how would you approach it? I know that's kind of a broad question, but you can take it from any direction you want. And what do you look for in coworkers and or employees um, as they're coming into the field? And I'll just let you all three volunteer to who wants to go first. <laughs> Randy, go. I mean, uh, yeah, I'll go first. I I I, um, I love this question, and um, 
I, because I have uh, college age um, kids, and so uh, have been trying to uh, let them know what I did. Um, so for me, it was uh, volunteering um, and internships, uh, seeking out volunteer programs and internships at museums, uh, art galleries, what have you. Um, there's uh, especially with small museums uh, in the, in your um, counties, uh, in your uh, cities. Um, there's a lot of time where those museums are working on little to no budget and they are begging for help. Um, I mean, and, and I mean, they, they appreciate a college student wanting to come and help organize a collection or um, photograph a collection, digitize. Um, there is, uh, I just feel like from what I've seen um, traveling around um, uh, smaller Oregon communities that there is a, a, a need for volunteership um, and uh, in, in the field. Um, of course, you know, there's, there's training that needs to go along with that, um, but, uh, but that experience is um, is huge, uh, and then also I would suggest that, uh, uh, and and this is a little bit uh, biased uh, because I just came off of the uh, board for this organization, but the Oregon Museums Association and Washington Museums Association, um, the the state uh, museums associations usually have uh, memberships for students. Um, and young professionals uh, at a very low cost. So um, that is a great way to make connections uh, and do networking. Uh, so I would suggest, highly suggest um, if you're not, if you don't wanna become a member, find out when their um, annual meeting is um, or any kind of you know, outreach that they're doing or public programming that they're doing and attend um, as a visitor. Um, and, and that's where you start making your connections and networking because um, it is as important who you know uh, as, as to what you know. And so, you know, uh, don't be afraid to, um, to get, your, get your, uh, your name and your face out there and just and have, so people can recognize you. And, you know, uh, we were talking, uh, all of us uh, on the panel and uh, before we, had students on and saying how we how we knew each other from other projects and other things and so it's it really is important that that networking aspect of it as far as what I look for in, in coworkers and, and in employees um, it's really just that uh, that drive to um, to get to the finish line to 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 get those projects completed um, we all have times where we um, need to take a step back or um, or, or might not. Um, take the lead on something, but uh, just that knowledge of why it's important to get to the finish line and, and what the ultimate goal is. Um, I look for people that, uh, that have that ability to have that vision um, and understanding of, of, of why projects are important. Laura, do you wanna go next? Yes, I would really echo what Randall was saying. That's you know tremendously helpful to think about volunteering. And increasingly, the museum field is you know moving towards paid internships. It you know depends on the organization, um, but you know certainly paid internships are another thing to to seek out. And um, I will say you know I did not set out to go into museum work and that it was really when I was making a career change and realized you know, how much I had loved public history and kind of saw in my own experience that I'd been doing a lot of public history that then I pivoted and moved into the museum field. And so I would also say like at the High Desert Museum specifically, we're often looking for people that are really content experts. And so you also can come at it, you know, if, if there is something that you're really passionate about, you know, keep going with that art history work that you're doing or history or science. Um, and, you know, that then that's also an avenue into museum work as well. In terms of what I'm looking for from coworkers, you know, for me, it's really um, a passion for the museum's mission. 
you know, as nonprofits, you know, I think when everyone is working in a nonprofit, you know, there, there needs to be something about the, the mission, the work that you're doing that really calls you to it because, um, because sometimes it is long hours and a lot of hats and, you know, when does not go into museum work to, to make the, you know, to, to make money. Um, and so I think, it, you know, you really do need to have that kind of commitment and drive um, and, you know, interest in, in the mission. And, um, and then I'm also looking for, you know, someone who's a creative thinker who wants to problem solve inevitably. And you all know this when you're working on a big project, things pop up and I feel like we're constantly problem solving or, you know, adjusting our plans. And then I'm also really looking for somebody that wants to work collaboratively because we really do work closely together. So I'd say those are some of the, the kind of key things. And Matt, I'll hand it off to you. Thanks, Laura. Uh, those were excellent points. Um, I think, so I was a art handler museum preparator uh, which is a very fun job, but uh, you don't really go to college for it or, or there's not usually a formal training for it. So it can be a very murky or opaque field to enter into because museums, if they're going to hire you, they want you to have some experience because you're handling the art. Um, so I, I do think uh, what Randall said, internships at art galleries where you could get some hands-on experience or other smaller museums, great. Um, I think any jobs that where you have uh, carpentry or welding or set building, those type of things, those skills come in handy and uh, would be a great benefit to, to uh, an art handling job. Um, I think also just to be honest, for a big museum like SFMOMA, if you get a job in the museum store or as an administrative assistant, you really just have to get your foot in the door. And like Randall was saying, meet people. And, um, you know, it can seem very opaque, but there's not that many people. So it's a small world. And by getting yourself in there uh, some way is, is is one entry point. Um, I really like art enthusiasm. I think like Laura said, you, there, are, there are some sacrifices, money being um, one of them. Uh, so passion can will carry you a long way. But for art handling too, having real respect and knowledge for, for art um, as an object is very important. So, and along with that attention to detail, um, when you're handling, you know, Matisse paintings, you really want someone that's not going to be um, sloppy. So that's one thing. And then just hard work, you know. I mean, like Laura said, there's often uh, a stressful last push for shows or um, taking a show down in a very small amount of time. So yeah, being a hard worker is something I look for as well. Um, Randy, go ahead. Yeah, I just was going to um, add to what Matt said. I, I started my first job here at, at Tomuslicht was working at our visitor services lobby uh, front desk and um, and, you know, got the weekend shift uh, and, you know, the kind of the hours that nobody else wanted. But, you know, it is all about and it was part time. Um, and so you, you do you, you get your foot in the door. And um, eventually, um, you know, they knew I wanted to do collection work. So um, slowly made my way back into the collection vault. Uh, and then that kind of led into, well, um, they saw I could uh, uh, manage projects. So then that turned into exhibits. And so you just build on it from there. But yeah, it's, it's all about getting your foot in the door and, and finding somewhere um, that you uh, can, can learn and soak up as much as you can. We've been really lucky to have the same director the entire time that I've been working for the museum. And she is, um, uh, I mean, she's somebody that uh, you just, you're a sponge whenever you're around her because she's uh, full of so much information and, and good ideas and, and ways about thinking of uh, uh, projects. So um, that's the only other thing I'd say is, is yeah, just um, your colleagues, 
are a great resource for you uh, and um, that, and just try to soak up as much as you can from uh, from the people that are around you and, and yeah not just your museum like your work colleagues but also your other students and obviously your professors and, and so just wanted to add that that I started out at the front desk. <laughs> So I think we will do one more question from me and then we'll move on to um, audience questions. What is the most important piece of advice that you've received um, in your career, related to your career? I mean, you could talk about life advice too, if it seems relevant, but mostly related to your career. Um, and maybe we could start with uh, Matt this time. Yeah, sure. And. I've been given a lot of advice, but I'll again speak to uh, the art handling our preparator job. And uh, so I, in, in that role, um, it, you come across a lot of different types of, of work, um, everything from a Damien Hirst um, cow's head in a tank of uh, formaldehyde to paintings and photographs. One uh, thing I was taught was that you treat all objects with equal care and attention. And so that could be like a Nike shoe that was bought for an architecture and design um, collection that literally you could go to Foot Locker and go buy it, but it's in a museum. It's being identified as an important object. And so I'm going to handle that Nike shoe with as much care as uh, Andy Warhol painting that's worth got gazillions of dollars so that just that um the attention to to detail and care for each object um but then also all of those objects are are just objects in the world and so they are going to have a history certain materials would deteriorate or they'll get damaged and those things happen as well so so having that that balance uh, made a difference for my job Thanks, Matt. Um, Laura, would you like to answer that question? You want me to repeat it or? <laughs> um, I was really trying to think about if there was a favorite piece of advice that I received. And I'll say, I definitely got lots of advice, but I'm not sure that I had a favorite piece. So I more was thinking about what do I wish somebody had told me? And a few things that I think, you know, sitting in all of your spot that I wished I had maybe thought a little bit more about is, you know, what are some of the things that matter to you most and kind of what shape do you want your life to take? And I think that there's some really practical things that I know I wasn't necessarily thinking about. Where do you want to live? What do you, how do you want to spend your time? What kind of work do you find purposeful and meaningful? And I think I mentioned this earlier, but kind of that career pivot and for me, I think I realize as I'm, you know, starting to now look at, you know, several years um, working, I can really see that there are some similar values and the ways that education has been really important to me and, you know, creating spaces of um, dialogue and um, so there's some, some really um, similar values throughout all of that, but the work itself has looked different. And I think really recognizing and allowing space that your career, you know, will very likely be long and, and likely have many chapters and, and that's okay. Um, and I think, you know, really truly embracing, which is really hard to do, um, the fact that some of the challenges or setbacks can actually, you know, truly get you then into another spot. Um, I know for me, you know, it was some challenges that then landed me at the museum, and I'm really glad that that's, that's where I am now. So, so really allowing, you know, allowing um, yourself that space. And the one other thing I'd say kind of really specific to museums that I had thought, I had certainly thought about, but I think I'm facing now more that I'm in the museum itself is the colonial legacy of museums. And this certainly isn't the case, you know, with all museums, um, but is the case with the High Desert Museum and many other art and history museums. Um, science museums, you know, many museums are really facing and, and should be grappling with their colonial legacy. So I say that just in that, um, that your work life might, you know, present some, um, some of those dilemmas and hopefully you can be a part of working towards solutions, but there's some really heavy history that comes with working in the museum field. And it's worth thinking about that and just thinking about 
you know, how you might feel in those situations and if that's work that you want to take on. Yeah, and it's often, it's not hypothetical, right? Like those, those questions are very concrete, very material as with everything that we deal with in a museum context. None of, like no, none of the thinking is hypothetical. It's all very concrete. Um, Randall, oh, sorry, Matt, did you want to respond to Laura before I hand it over to Randall? Go ahead. Yeah, sure. And I'll just say, I, I no longer work for SFMOMA, but there museums can be very um, political hotbed places, uh, like Laura was saying, and um, with a whole history. And um, I think being a, a, work, a hands-on worker, like the, you're the labor, you're the art labor. And you know, the museum board might be in, in my case was made up of, you know, some pretty 1% financial people. And, uh, and so the discrepancy between those things can be very complicated. And um, yeah, I just think it's worth being honest about all of that. And I am worth questioning it for sure. And I think a lot of institutions, um, major institutions are having to rethink their structure and attitudes towards a lot of things. And I think that that's a really good thing. Um, but, but yeah, just to follow up with that kind of aspect of many museums. Yeah, that's a great, um, great point, Matt. Um, Randall, would you like to take that same question? Sure. Um, one of my favorite things that uh, was told to me um, was, and Matt, you said this a little bit earlier or something similar, but um, one, of, one of the sayings that I've always carried is to um, care for the objects as you would care for a person um, because they do have uh, they do have a story, they have their own life, um, either by the person um, that made them or how they were used. Um, we try to do that with, um, with our collection um, here uh, to, to treat those items with respect and, um, and really uh, to, to treat them like we would a person. So, uh, and then another thing, um, uh, similar to that, we try to um, ask our collection folks, if you're having a bad day, um, if you know, you've got other things on your mind, um, try to find something, if you're able to, try to find something to do other than handling the collection um, that, at that time. Because, um, you know, it's just uh, kind of one of those things where you, you need to prepare yourself um, before you um, are handling something that's 100 plus years old uh, or something that's priceless. Um, and, uh, and you need to know where you're going to be picking it up from, um, you need to know where you're gonna be moving it to before you touch it. Um, you know, you have to have the tools and the things that you need um, with you. Um, and so just to be in a good mind frame, I guess, uh, when you're, when you're handling, handling collections and to treat those with, um, with uh, the respect you would a person um, is some of the best advice that I've been given. But um, also just to, uh, just to listen, um, uh, and, uh, and be patient because um, a lot of times in the museum field, young professionals uh, will be working alongside of somebody who's been in the museum profession for quite a long time. Um, and as uh, both panelists have said, um, uh, museum work um, has a long history and, and uh, methods have changed. And um, that's not always an easy thing uh, for young professionals and, and seasoned professionals to, um, to work out. Um, so it's, uh, it's just being patient, listening, um, and, uh, and learning what you can, because regardless of, of the, um, the methods that were um, used as far as collection handling and things like that, there still is a lot of history you can gain from um, the people uh, that you're that are also in the museum that have been there for for, for a while. 
Thank you all three um, so much for answering my questions so thoughtfully and thoroughly. Um, I'm going to turn it over to the room. And I think we have a first question in the chat box here. For those of you listening, if you prefer to um, unmute yourselves and speak up, that's fine. Or you can also put your questions in the chat box. And I'm happy to read them out to our panelists. Uh, so our first question um, is from uh, Lisa Odin, who uh, is wondering, does anyone have any insight into the career track of independent curating? Um, thinking of consultants, but also exhibition design companies that aren't museums, but work closely with museums. Um, the, the only thing I would say is that um, those museums associations, whether it be state uh, or national museums associations, there's a few, uh, there's Western Museum Association, um, there, uh, is it um, AASLH um, and, and others that are national? Um, anyway, that's where you need to uh, be involved and have get your networking um, in uh, because that's where I've met a lot of the um, independent curators um, that I know. Yeah, I'll just add to that AAM is also a great organization to become a part of, you have to pay a membership, but it's well worth it if you're interested in the field. I would, would kind of echo everything that, that has been said. And I guess the one other thing I would offer is that you know, right now during COVID, a lot of the organizations are doing virtual conferences. So this might be a good time to see what AAM is up to. I think last year they were virtual. So anyway, you may be able to more easily access some of that content right now without traveling to the conferences. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions? Oh, here, I've got something here. Oh, so uh, if you haven't noticed in the chat box, the Student Engagement Center has very kindly been looking up um, uh, the links to the different organizations that our panelists have mentioned and putting those in the chat box. So you have all of those resources there. And then um, I should also mention that um, uh, Kim Rolf is letting us know that if you're interested in how to build your network with Whitman grads and others working in museums, galleries, and other archival roles, a student engagement center career coach can help you. So you can feel free to schedule a networking appointment on Handshake. All right, are there any other questions for our esteemed panelists? Uh, hi, I had a, a question kind of about uh, courses and kind of course study being in uh, under, as an undergrad student right now. So uh, my question is how critical or advantageous are museum study courses in future museum careers? I'm currently in history and classics and I'm looking towards a museum or collections centered career. And I know many don't necessarily specialize in museum studies or graduate with that type of degree, or they might not have had access to those courses, but just kind of generally about that kind of thing. I would say at the High Desert Museum, there are you know, lots of paths to, to working at the museum and that certainly some members on our staff have done museum studies programs. And I think especially when it comes to things like collection handling um, and art preparator work that it would be really helpful to have some of that museum studies specific coursework. I think it really depends on, you know, what role you most want at the museum. And I would say, you know, the more, if, if, if it's something that you know you're interested in, I think that that's a great avenue to learn more and to, to, to make sure that, the, that it is something that really interests you. But I also, you know, my own experience is that it's not mandatory. Yeah, um, I'll just chime in um, as an art handler, art preparator, it, um, the, it is not, a requirement or or anything like that, but I do think it could help. Um, I think registrars and this this kind of role uh, typically didn't have formal training prior, but now I think almost all registration jobs um, 
you know, require some sort of museum studies coursework. So if you're interested in that role, like Laura was saying, I do think it's well worth it and might be a requirement. Um, I, I didn't, they, I didn't have any museum, uh, class courses that I took, but I did do a lot of training, uh, once I got into, uh, the field, there's a lot of great, um, certification, uh, museum certification programs that are out there, um, some through, uh, universities. And I, I know at least for the American Indian Museum, as far as the Smithsonian goes, there's some training programs that they do. I don't know about other uh, Smithsonian museums, but anyway, there's a lot of uh, training opportunities out there. Um, I just didn't have a lot of the uh, availability of courses, museum courses uh, when I was going to school. And so most of my training came after. I would say as well that the role of museums is really changing. So I could see, I mean, I would love now to sit in in a museum studies course and have more opportunities to learn from others and talk with others about the ways that museums are changing. And I would say that they're kind of shifting from, you know, in the past kind of that model of, you know, the kind of cabinet of curiosities to being spaces that are really about um, community and about, you know, spaces of dialogue. And I know one thing I'm really trying to do at the High Desert Museum is we're really trying to create a space where everyone sees themselves reflected on the walls. And so I would say that there are a lot of shifts, you know, within the field and that it would be, you know, tremendously helpful to have time to reflect on that and to learn about that and think about that. And it, it does seem like in this moment, you know, now more than ever, you know, museums, I think, do need to be making that shift in order to, to still be relevant. Yeah, I 100% uh, agree and wish I had time to go to a museum's course study at this moment for that reason. Do we have any other questions from the room for our panelists? In the chat box or feel free to unmute and speak. Um, I have something, um, and, and I would like to get the panelists take on this too. We've been talking a lot about, I guess, kind of the, the good things about working for museums, but uh, maybe we should talk a little bit about some of the challenges um, of working for museums. Uh, and Matt, you talked a little bit about the working with the board uh, or having the board. And I know uh, Laura uh, and uh, myself, uh, there's, there's always that hierarchy of um, where as a museum worker, uh, you want to uh, get the, uh, an interpretation out or an exhibit out or um, collections need to be cared for a certain way. But uh, it's those layers for us here at, at Tmuslik, we're a um, entity of the tribal government. So anything we do uh, has to go through the uh, kind of the tribal government bureaucracy and uh, getting things approved. Um, also, the other thing is uh, for us, uh, we have base funding to help to keep the lights on, the doors open and um, you know some exhibits coming in, but any specific work that we wanna do, it's usually a matter of going out and finding grant funds to fund that work. Um, and uh, so that's another hat you get to wear um, is, is either finding grants, um, managing grant projects or working um, along grant projects that have deliverables and deadlines. Um, so anyway, just uh, uh, I'll throw it over to uh, Laura and, and Matt. Um, just thought that was an important thing. I'm really glad you brought that up and um, I would, you know, echo similar challenges, I would say that often we're trying to do a lot with um, a relatively small team. And so, you know, again, with that variety, which is kind of the, the good way of saying it, the kind of flip side of that can be feeling, you know, pulled in too many directions, kind of that feel, those feelings of, um, you know, of burnout or just feeling like, like one is juggling a lot of different things. So that can definitely be a challenge. Um, 
And, um, you know, certainly too needing to, you know, as, as Randall mentioned, you know, as a curator, you are, you know, are often the project lead, but you certainly have a lot of other people that you need to be working with and coordinating with. And um, so it's not, you know, in my experience, at least it's not my project, it really is a team project. And so that means that sometimes, you know, kind of compromising and negotiating on, on what that um, exhibition content is going to be. And certainly it's working with the board too, and trying to share with the board kind of what's going on in the field. And at times, you know, the staff, you know, we might be wanting to kind of push at some of those boundaries. And so kind of needing to make sure that everyone is on board with, with what we're wanting to do. Um, and one other thing that, um, that I'll just mention on less of a challenge, but more of kind of an exciting direction uh, that I do feel like we're heading in is more community curation and really handing over that curatorial control and working really closely with communities and partners. And that has been incredibly re rewarding. Um, that also, of course, you know, takes more time and is more coordination and more voices. So I think while that's really exciting that that adds another kind of layer of complexity to projects as well. That sounds very cool, Laura. I love hearing that. Um, so I'll just real quick uh, be honest and forthright with the fact that um, if you love art and art exhibits, um, one thing that can happen working behind the scenes is that you become jaded and no longer like art exhibits because you see them uh, only as a series of challenges or, uh, you know, something that serves uh, rich people and rich people's co art collections and values. And it's real. I mean, I, I work for the Walla Walla Foundry now. We're making art every day. It's fun. It's cool. It's insane what people pay for these objects. And are these meaningful objects going into the world? Do they deserve that price tag? I don't know. And it's certainly, you know, something to question. Uh, I think a lot of people, especially museum preparators, can become jaded. I uh, luckily somehow was not one. I still believe in art and art shows, but it, it can be a challenge uh, when you come into contact with that level of, um, you know, discrepancy of finances and culture and, and all of that. Can I add something to the sort of list of, of uh, challenges that I think is particularly relevant to a lot of our students? Um, Randall, you mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, it's important to kind of get a foot in the door, volunteer, um, do internships. Um, and Laura, you mentioned that many internships are now paid, but that's not true for all internships, right? And um, it's all well and fine to want to do internships if you have to also make a living after you're graduating from college. It's hard to find the time to do the internships or the volunteering that can get you into the door. And um, this is a, it's a big uh, equity issue in uh, the museum field. So um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that that is, it's a problem and I don't know what the, what the solution is, but it is an issue. So, um, okay, so we're, it's 525, which is when I said we would end. We do have a wonderful question from Kinda Kiefel that I'm gonna ask you all to try to answer in just like a couple of words, cause I think, or like a sentence, cause I think it's, it's a fun one to end on a happier note. Um, so Kinda asks, uh, do you have a dream object or dream subject or project that you would like to pursue um, a show for or work on at your institution within the next five years? So what's your kind of short um, wish list? I'm working on a dream project. We are renovating the exhibition on the Indigenous Plateau. And in fact, I get to work with Randall on this project. And it's a, a project with a team of Native advisors throughout the plateau. And I absolutely love working with this group of people. And I feel like we're doing something. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to see where the project's going to go. Awesome. Thank you, Laura. Um, Randall, do you want to answer that question real quick? That is a very tough question. Um, <laughs> I think as far as goals go, uh, one of our 
one of our big goals collection wise is to bring the treaty home for good. Um, and uh, we consider ourselves a national archive for the Confederate tribes of Umatilla. Um, currently the, the document is at the US National Archives. Uh, we brought it home for a visit. We'd like to bring it home for good. Awesome. Thank you, Randall. Um, Matt, would you like to real quick answer that question? Yeah, sure, Randall. That sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, some collections, many collections, maybe every collection has art that rarely gets shown because it's just too ugly. And I always like, I thought that was amusing and would really like to create a show where it's all the stuff that never gets shown. It's called the ugly show. And uh, it's everything that never makes the cut because it looks horrible. Um, I think that would be fun. Now that I'm at the foundry, there's a lot of um, pieces and parts that don't, that get um, set aside because they don't make the cut. I would love to see something happen with those um, half done sculpture, pre, you know, half packed art. I love all that stuff. So do something like that. I'm so glad I asked uh, Kinda's question because I feel like all three of your answers are so, they're so different from each other and so, so interesting. Um, and I would totally go see that show. Um, I think that we are out of time. Um, Nikki, did you want to um, sort of talk us out? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, thank you so much everyone for attending. What a wonderful evening, a wonderful conversation. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach. We would love to guide you on that journey, perhaps, towards more opportunities and museum studies. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>